I ask everyone while they're joining um, to mute and turn off your video camera, please. Right, I think we'll um, we'll start. I'll start going through a few of the niceties um, while people are finally joining. So, good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, an introduction to MIS, the Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence, based in Pembroke Dock. I'm Paul Ellsmore. I'm, I lead our team in Wales. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the conference so far. Thanks for turning in, uh, tuning into this uh, side event. Um, before I go through the um, agenda, if that will move on. So before I go through that agenda, um, can I make a, a few quick... All right, all right. Please turn your camera uh, off and mute yourself um, while we're doing the presentations. Um, I need to inform you that the session's being recorded and that session will be put onto our, that is ORE Catapult's YouTube channel. Um, we're using the chat function for questions. So put your questions in the chat function as we go through. There will be a break for questions and a bit of an open session towards the end for other questions. Um, so first thing I'm going to do today is just introduce you all to the Catapult Network. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, our particular catapult, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, then we'll, we'll move into a few other people doing presentations. Um, Michelle will start us off with the Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence. We'll move on to some case studies We'll start talking about some of the other things we do in Wales apart from MIS. Um, our colleague from Cornwall and Southwest, Simon Cheeseman, will introduce Tiger, the largest interreg programme anyone's ever done, and the Celtic Sea Cluster, which is um, a collaboration between Wales and Southwest England on floating wind. I'll come back then and give you a little bit of a, a run through innovation challenges and how we hope to use these as part of our MIS programme. If we've got time left then, we'll have an open session where we can have a bit of to and fro about questions. Um, and I'll close up at about five to five this afternoon. So, Catapult Networks. We're a part of a family of nine catapults and these are digital, connected places, medicines discovery, satellite applications, energy systems, value manufacturing, cell and gene therapy, compound semiconductor applications, which is based in Wales, one of the newest ones, and our own catapult, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. All the catapults are funded uh, publicly through Innovate UK. We're all not-for-profit organizations, and we all do research and development in our chosen sector. We tend to sit closer to the market than universities would generally um, do. Um, and we exist to support UK industry. So the, the R&D that we do is to make our industry stronger. So our particular catapult, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, it covers offshore wind um, and also wave and tidal technologies. But to be fair, about 80% of the work we do is related to wind because the wind industry is now so big um, and so valuable to the UK. Wave and tidal will have their time, but they're at an earlier stage of development at the moment. There's also an increasing focus on floating wind, and we think this will actually help 
wave and tidal coming through. And there's also an increasing focus on integration of renewables, the kind of energy systems approach that we hear a lot about, and particularly green hydrogen. That's hydrogen that's generated from re renewable electricity rather than from oil, oil and gas, uh, as it is at the moment. So we are a UK-wide organisation. We're headquartered in Glasgow. That's where we were first set up. We have massive test facilities in Blythe, that's just north of Newcastle on the east coast of England. We have regional centres all over the UK, including our Welsh office in Pembroke Dock. Um, we engage with the universities in many different ways all over the UK, but particularly we have three academic hubs, one based on blade technology, one on electrical infrastructure and one on powertrains. And we also have a new research centre in China. That's what this little weird little bit of the graphic is. This is um, our talk centre, the TUS Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult Research Centre in Yantai, Yantai City. So offshore wind is incredibly important, absolutely critical to our net zero targets as a nation. And the Committee for Climate Change has said that we need 75 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. That's a massive opportunity for UK business. Um, there's perhaps 200 billion pounds going to be spent over the next 30 years uh, on offshore wind. And it's part of our job as ORE Catapult to help UK businesses capture as much of that as possible. And also to help those industries export into what will be an even bigger offshore wind global market. And over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna make a shameless plug for um, our impact, our capabilities um, since we uh, came into being. Um, and you can see more detail on all of this on the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult website. Just to summarise this slide, hundreds of SMEs supported since we started in 2013, 63 international projects in the last year alone, and over 150 R&D projects currently on the go, right now on the go. We've uh, benchmarked our performance by looking at the companies that we've worked with compared to a, uh, a control study group of over a thousand UK companies. Um, and the companies that we've worked with were able, in our estimation, to raise 12 times as much private investment, were seven times more likely to win grant funding, and four times more likely to be classified as high growth companies. So we think, we think we're doing a decent job. And like all catapults, we work on a five-year business plan cycle that's agreed with Innovate UK up front. We're, we're part way through our recent um, five-year plan. And as you can see, we've got some pretty ambitious targets uh, to achieve. Um, we hope to be able to evidence a, a GVA contribution to the UK economy of 600 million pounds. And how do we do that? How are we actually going to deliver those impacts? Well, generally speaking, we deliver these targets broadly through three flavours, three strands. So our test and validation strand uses our world leading test facilities in Blythe that I mentioned earlier. So for instance, we can test turbine blades that are over 100 metres long. You see that in the bottom left hand corner on the screen there. Um, we can dress, uh, uh, test offshore wind drive trains up to 15 megawatts. This is our Fujin facility here. Um, and our operational performance strand, that looks at how we can use new techniques and technologies to get more out of the existing wind farms that we have in the UK. Um, and our research and disruptive innovation strand, that nurtures emerging technologies that are going to underpin the future wind farms and also enable tidal and wave technologies to become mainstream and start adding the same kind of value to the UK economy that offshore wind does now. Good example of what we're doing in the wind uh, arena. 
we're working with uh, GE of, of the United States to prove the world's largest offshore wind turbine, Halley 8X, in various forms up to 14 megawatts as a single turbine. Um, our test facilities allow GE to simulate years of operation at sea in just months of operation on land. Um, and that's absolutely essential to de-risk this technology for GE, but also for the companies that are hoping to use it because these turbines are already written in, penciled in for wind farms that are in, in development at the moment. And they're absolutely crucial to driving down the cost of energy to a point where subsidy free uh, CFDs in the UK uh, become mainstream. We, we're already very, very close to subsidy free uh, support for offshore wind, but it's because of these big turbines that are expected to come through in the future that we're capable of having those uh, very low cost of energy from wind farms, offshore wind farms going forward. We do a few other things um, that generally support our industry, um, our thought leadership. Um, as an independent trusted third party, we can help to inform both industry and government about current trends and future trends. Um, in particular, we, we offer cost modeling and economic forecasting that helps to underpin um, strategic uh, ideas in government. And part of that led to the offshore wind sector deal as part of um, uh, the UK's um, industrial strategy. Um, and we, um, we helped deliver a range of UK wide grant and funding support initiatives. So check out the Catapult website for more details on the likes of Launch Academy, um, Fit for Offshore Renewables, and of course the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership, which is, it is as part of the sector deal, as part of the industrial strategy, a 100 million pound initiative led by ORE Catapult. And in fact, we've got three companies in Wales now benefiting from support under OWGP. I can't tell you who they are because they haven't been formally announced yet, but there are three of them um, and we hope many more to come. Um, and this is basically just another way of looking at um, how we uh, categorise our various op uh, operations. Um, we've just talked about accelerated next generation technology. That's what we're doing with GE. Energy systems integration, the hydrogen economy, um, how, we, how we manage to integrate all of this offshore wind into our uh, electrical and power infrastructure. We'll have presentations on a few of those. Floating offshore wind, as I say, right up the agenda. Simon will say a bit more about that in the um, Celtic Sea cluster presentation. Um, and we're always looking at smart and sustainable operations for our existing um, wind farms in the UK. Um, and that's enough of ORE catapult in the wider sense. So I'm gonna hand over to Michelle now to talk about MIS. Thanks, Paul. I'll just share my screen. So I'm Michelle Hitches. I am the project manager for Marine Energy Engineering Centre of Excellence, known as MIS, and also the Milford Haven Energy Kingdom project, which I will introduce to you later on in the presentation. MIS is an £11 million project, part funded by the European Regional Development Fund and partly through the Swansea Bay City deal. We have two different funding streams and this allows us to collaborate with the Welsh universities, Swansea, Cardiff, Cardiff Met and also Bangor. MIS is one of the four projects involved in the £60 million Pembroke Dot Marine project alongside META, Pembroke Port Developments and the Pembrokeshire Demonstration Zone. If you'd like to know more information about the Pembroke Dot Marine project, they have a stand in the exhibition area. 
So what is MIS? MIS was developed to carry out research and development projects with companies in the West Wales and the Valleys region. So this is shown in the dark pink area on the map. Our aim is to help support innovation predominantly in the marine energy sector, but not exclusively. So we can work with companies to support them in designing of projects and components, building, testing, verification and validation. Obviously, being part of a funded project, we have targets that we have to achieve. So these include bringing new products and services to a company, new products and services to the marketplace, new patents, new jobs and research collaborations. Our natural target client is the marine energy supply chain and developers, but we are also looking for projects in the aquaculture, hydrogen, and really any product or service that would benefit from being demonstrated in the Milford Haven waterway. We are flexible with our project timescales. We're looking for projects anywhere from six weeks up to nine months with varying budgets. Our funding doesn't allow us to give companies grants, but what it does allow us is to purchase generic or bespoke equipment, including ADCPs, cameras, radars, We've re recently purchased a buoy, which allows us to test devices out at sea, which Arna Magnus will talk about later on. The MIS team. So we currently have nine employees, normally based in Pembroke Dock, COVID allowing. So alongside myself and Paul, we have Francesca, who is our procurement specialist. We have three innovation managers. Joseph, Magnus and Di. Um, and we're also looking to recruit a innovation manager in North Wales this year. We have three engineers. We have Arne, who is our senior engineer, Rachel, who's our mechanical graduate engineer and Derry, who's our GIS engineer. And we are currently recruiting for an electronic engineer. If you'd like to know any more about the project, or you have a product or service that you'd like to talk to us about, feel free to contact myself or any of the team throughout the conference. Um, we're on our, the exhibition stand all day tomorrow, um, but also all of our contact details are on our webpage, which is mies.org.uk. So I'm now gonna pass you over to Arne, who's gonna give you an overview of our MIS engineering capability. Thank you, Michel, and good afternoon, everyone. Great to have you all here on board and uh, certainly like the opportunity to tell us, tell you a little more about what we're doing. I just need to share my screen now. Bear with me a second, please. Oops. Great, so yes, Michel, <laughs> already said a few words about our engineering capability or uh, what we are generally doing. So it's about supporting companies, could be sole trader, could be SMEs, could be large corporations. We're quite flexible there. And again, with the projects, we are also very flexible. Generally, we can provide support starting with the, the uh, conceptual design. If somebody's got a good idea, doesn't really know how to do this, what can be done, then that's a starting point for us to get engaged and possibly just provide some, some guidance, some ideas, some support and some, some technological input and how to develop this idea further. And then it goes down all the whole hog up to full concept realization um, where we can support the full testing, building, commissioning of ultimately full scale energy converters, but it's probably not our target marking, uh, market, the full scale situation. Um, so we, we got the meta sites here, as Michelle mentioned already, the marine energy test area. And one of the core ideas is that we support technology development and then provide support input and assistance with the operational testing of devices and technology. So it's not <laughs> converters, what we're looking at, we're looking at the full range of any auxiliary equipment Michelle has mentioned a number of items that we can buy, and that's absolutely correct, but we can expand that list really infinitely because there are a lot of pieces of equipment out there that we don't really know at the moment that we can use them for marine energy. 
And that's what innovation is about to some extent. So we have to find out novel ways possibly for existing technology or we have to develop new technology. And that's what we can do. So we've got a small team in Pembrokeshire, normally operating out of Pembroke Dock. Um, and that local team allows us to put on direct support in the local region here, of course. But then if we run out of resources here of the situations where we feel we don't have the right competence in our team, we can hand this over, pull in support from our wider catapult family. So it's, it's a great team that we have across the UK. So if there's support required from Blythe, Glasgow, or anywhere else, then that's not a problem. And if we feel that we really need external expertise, then it's also an option to just procure some additional support, some consultancy services, validation services. So it's certainly worth talking to us if anybody's got an idea uh, what the, they want to do something. So just briefly mentioned these two pictures here on the slide. Um, the top is just an ADCP, which is open the circuit board. More interesting, possibly the one at the bottom, that's the side scan sonar image looking at the scour of a cable. So it was a cable dragged across the seafloor and then with the uh, side scan sonar that allows us to see it really, like you would see it with your eyes. It's just a different technology that we are using. So I'm trying to put this forward. Okay. So just a few examples of what we can do, what we are doing. So if there's any requirement for some cut drawings, if somebody's got an idea, but they don't really have the skill or the, the equipment to use the drawings that allows something to be passed on for, for manufacturing, that's something where we can come in. We can do some stress analysis, CFD analysis, looking at fatigue issues, overall stresses and forces, and of course, looking at hydrodynamic behavior, which is very relevant to our work environment, of course, so finding out what happens exactly, what's the impact of turbulence, what's happening in extreme wave situations, or indeed very benign wave situations, um, because we need to find out how we can operate our equipment. So the first piece, is, or the first piece of kit that we have for uh, last year was the big test boy. That's a former test boy used by marine power systems for the testing and fab test of the wave energy converter device. And we, uh, we're able to transport this over to Pembroke Dock, where it's sitting on Keysight at the moment. We are in the process of refurbishing this equipment. And the first project that we are going to deliver with this test boy is to look at mooring forces and compare them against wave input. So the idea is to have a number of load shackles connected to the mooring line, to the single riser, and then find out how do these load shackles compare with each other, what is the longevity, what's the failure rate, and how do the measured forces, how do they compare against the wave input on a wave by wave base or also on a spectral wave base. And then of course what is also very important is to compare and the so they they mentally with him saying things. that's so you, can you un no not unmute mute yourself because somebody could be heard. So we'll be running a lot of uh, numerical software solutions. We are working with OrcaFlex and Ansys Aqua mainly at the moment. And then of course once we have the boy in the water we can and compare and calibrate and validate our model findings. I'll just show you this short video here. Hope it comes through. So that's the model output from OrcaFlex. You can see, well, it's just a nice graphical animation that's really just for presentation purposes. It contains little technical value on the top left side, but you can see the, the boy moving with the mooring dynamics on the top right hand side. And then the two graphs at the bottom that shows the sea surface elevation and then also the forces on the line and the forces are very important because that's what uh, knowledge of that is required to size the mooring equipment properly. And the follow-up project from this one, my colleague Magnus will tell you about it in a second, is then to find ways, novel ways to reduce these mooring forces, which then can lead to a considerable cost reduction. And that of course is of interest to everyone. Happy to answer any questions uh, either today after the session or just contact me and I hand over to Magnus now, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, let me just try and share my screen. Come to the end as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I'm I'm Magnus. I'm an innovation manager here um, as part of the Catapults team in Wales. Um, this next part is just to talk about a few of our case studies. Um, so we've got three case studies to to quickly run through. Uh, the first of which, uh, as Aaron said, is actually uh, a project that involves using the, the Mies boy. Um, this is with a company called Intelligent Marines. Uh, they're a North Wales 
uh, based SME uh, developing this technology called the, the Intelligent Marine System or IMS for, for short. Um, it's, it's a marine damper that's uh, being developed for the floating wind market. Uh, the sort of easiest way to think about that is it's essentially a large shock absorber that you, you place on the end of your marine line. And, and the reason you do that is that you can reduce the, the, the peak forces that your, your marine system is, is subject to. Um, and there's a lot of interest in, in this space because um, you, you know, marine, marine systems, they're a unique uh, differentiator that separates floating wind from fixed bottom wind. It's a new subsystem that the, the, you know, the offshore wind market is having to, to deal with. And there's a lot of scope for, for innovation in this space. There's a lot of potential for cost reduction. Uh, we know that marine systems can account for as much as 10% of floating wind capex. And um, by using a system like this, which can reduce uh, marine forces, uh, it enables you to use uh, lower grade, lighter and lower cost marine materials. Uh, so it could you know, lead to a step change reduction in, in marine costs. Um, there are a number of indirect benefits as well using something like this. Um, you know, if you're reducing the marine forces, uh, then the chances are you'll be able to get away with using smaller anchors. Um, and then again, if you're using lighter uh, marine materials, you might be able to use cheaper insulation vessels. So there's a lot of potential for, for technology and we're seeing um, a lot of uh, companies in the, the load reduction space at the moment. Uh, moving on to the, the MIS project that we're running with Intelligent Marines. Um, so they've developed the technology to date, uh, primarily through laboratory testing. Um, in the MIS project, uh, we're looking at, uh, we're, we're going to, to test the, the Intelligent Marine System um, on our MIS boy as part of the marine system for, for the MIS boy. And it will be installed at the marine energy test area later this year. So that will be the, the, the first opportunity to see how it performs in, in a real world environment. Uh, it gives us a chance to verify its marine durability, uh, take the technology to TRL7, and by comparing the marine forces with, on, the, on the buoy with and without the system, we can really get, uh, uh, get, you know, begin to quantify the, the load reduction potential for, for this technology. Um, that then will be followed by kind of some techno economic assessment type work uh, where, you know, based on uh, the, the results we found from, from testing, we can begin to put that into our uh, floating wind cost models and see um, if we can, you know, reduce loads or forces by, by X amount. What does that mean on the, uh, the levelized cost of energy for, for floating wind, wind turbines? So, Working with intelligent moons, we can build up, uh, begin to build up a sort of um, sales pitch for them, really. The, the second case study uh, we'd like to talk about is uh, with Bombora. So most of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with uh, Bombora. Um, we worked with them last year to advance the development of their floating M-Wave product. Um, the picture on, on the right shows you, um, you know, a conceptual image of the, the current design, which is uh, a seabed mounted um, M wave, uh, and that's suited to shallow uh, water environments, sort of near shore locations where the water depths are around about 10, 10 to 15 meters. And we're going to see something like this uh, installed off the coast of Pembrokeshire later this year, which is very exciting for all of us. Um, for Bomboras, from, for their, from their point of view, it's a, a great initial environment for them to work in. Um, it allows them to um, de-risk their technology and evaluate their unique selling points. Um, but I think um, they would acknowledge that uh, the lion's share of the, the wave energy resource can be found in, in, in deeper waters. And the current design that they have um, isn't, isn't suited to, to those sites. So, so they approached us um, to begin looking at mounting their M-Wave device on, on a floating platform um, as a means of accessing um, the, the lion's share and the, the deeper sites. It's actually a very um, similar thought process to, to the one that the offshore wind sector has followed 
uh, you know, for all of the uh, first offshore wind projects utilized fixed bottom offshore wind turbines. And now we're really seeing the emergence of floating wind um, as we go further from shore and um, yeah, tapping into those uh, greater resources found, found, found in the offshore environment. In this uh, project with Bombora, um, so we collaborated them. It was actually mostly a desk-based project uh, where we uh, started by uh, building numerical models of uh, floating platforms for, for Bombora uh, using the OrcaFlex software. And really it was about um, sort of taking them from a, a blank sheet of paper um, to a point where they got comfortable with a few design variants that um, had favorable characteristics that they could then take forwards to a detailed engineering stage. So we, we modeled fairly generic platforms uh, and modified simple parameters like geometry um, and platform mass, as well as the mooring system um, to, to kind of reduce that design space for them. And Bombora are now taking some of these designs forward in that detailed engineering um, stage. Secondly, um, we also completed a review of uh, Bombora's in-house economic model. Um, so this is something that we're particularly uh, skilled in. We have um, in-house uh, economic models that we've developed over years from working with the offshore wind sector. And um, you know, we've been able to kind of cast our minds back as, as well to see how offshore wind costs reduce over time, um, what assumptions are being used in, in, in those models. Um, and really, we were able to feed that information back to Bombora, cast an eye over their model and kind of cross check that with, with our in-house capabilities um, to make sure that the, the assumptions and the costs they're using are, 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 are good ones. And um, advise them on on rooms on room for for improvement, um, and that is kind of given them the confidence to 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 go forwards with uh, kind of techno economic work um, in the development of uh, M Wave. Okay, so that's case study two. Uh, the next one uh, I'm going to actually hand over to my colleague Joe to to talk about. Hi there all. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, my, my name is Joseph Kidd. I'm one of the other innovation managers with MIS. Um, this third uh, case study uh, that we thought it'd be good to share share with everyone um, is, is around the use of vortex generators. Um, it wasn't something that I'd come across before joining MIS, uh, but it's, it's a technique that uh, has been used in a number of other sectors uh, for a while now uh, to improve aerodynamics. Uh, and it ha is something that's been looked at for the wind sector uh, for, for, for a while now. Um, and it, it's now starting to be incorporated into new turbine blades being developed. Uh, so it's obviously something of relevance to to people interested in developing new offshore wind, uh, but there's obviously a, a large retrofit market as well. Um, it's also something that is starting to be, be looked at for, uh, for tidal devices as well. Uh, so it's a technique uh, fitting uh, these the small vortex generators two blades um, to, to improve the aerodynamics and hence improve the performance. Uh, so wh where they have been installed on uh, wind turbines, uh, it's been uh, onshore wind turbines and they've generally improved performance by up to 3%, which, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but obviously, yeah, uh, when you look at that over a, over a large array project, uh, yeah, that really mounts up. If you could move on, Magnus. So the project we've been developing um, uh, is with uh, Swansea University, who have capability. Um, uh, yeah, what one of their one of the leading researchers used to work in Formula One and ha has a lot of experience in, in aerodynamics. Um, and 
and uh, we brought them together with Natural Power, who I'm sure quite a few of you are familiar with, uh, a large renewables consultancy, uh, who uh, one of their service offerings is the O&M of, of wind farms. Uh, so they were obviously interested in w whether this is something that they could offer as a service. Um, so we've we've put a project together. Uh, Swans University are, are looking at a, a new approach that they're confident could actually exceed the three percent that's already been demonstrated. Um, so we're we're in the process of finalising. Um, yeah getting the, the project approved. It's looking like it's going to be an 18 month project, uh, making use of both the facilities at Swansea University, so their, their wind tunnel uh, and their modeling capability uh, and our own assets. So uh, ORE Catapult has a seven megawatts uh, turbine at Levenmouth. Uh, so we're, we're looking to, to utilize that. Um, so, yeah, we, we thought this was both a, a, a good example of uh, how through MIS we're able to utilise both our, our own assets uh, and our university partners uh, and, and also show how, whilst we are limited to some extent, that we need uh, to be working with Welsh-based supply chain companies, natural power uh, uh, is headquartered in, in Scotland, but the fact that they have an office in, in Aberystwyth uh, means we're able to justify working with them on this project. Okay, that, that's all for me. I'm passing on to, to, to Michelle now. No, I think we're going to call. Cool. Just, just while we're waiting, yeah, as has been said before, if, um, if there's any interest in any of these projects, please get in touch. We've got the stand um, at, uh, and we are actively looking to develop more projects through MIS. So, so if you have any potential innovation challenges uh, that, that you'd be keen to build a project around, yeah, please get in touch. Okay, well, thanks for that, Joe. Um, actually, we're going to take a, a quick break now. Um, we're a little bit ahead of time, um, which is great. So we thought we'd break for 10 minutes to take some questions, maybe. Um, I notice we've got on chat, we've got um, a couple of points from Manuel um, about our interaction in the Far East. Um, we do have, um, as Simon has pointed out, we do have um, a big cooperation with China. Um, I understand your sensitivities um, around other countries in that area and China. But China's a big player. Um, it's a big part. It has to be a big part of um, reaching net zero, mitigating climate change problems. And we're very, we're part of helping them find that solution. I, I hope that doesn't put any barriers in the way of us um, dealing with other, other countries in the area. It shouldn't. Um, but as Simon points out, uh, we're, we are um, a government supported company um, organization. So we do have to take direction from UK government on how we deal um, in, in these areas. Um, but we're here to support the likes of DIT. Um, so I don't know if that uh, if that's a satisfactory answer, Manuel. Do we have any other questions from anyone else? If not, um, I think we'll move on. We can move on, um, and it will be Magnus up next. I think. Um, just give it another couple of minutes, Magnus. People taking the opportunity to go and get a cup of coffee or take a comfort break.
Cool. Yeah. Uh, just while we're waiting, is Max here, Max Carcass. I was just wondering, um, I'm fortunate I missed the earlier session, so I'm not sure what you covered. Um, um, but I was just wondering, if you, has, um, have you talked, um, has Catapult talked at all about um, things like um, blade detection, uh, blade uh, impact detection um, in this session, or is that not something you're covering? In uh, no, um, I'll touch on that briefly, Max, when we talk about innovation challenges. Um, mm. I don't want to but we had, we had planned a innovation challenge for last year, but um, we were overtaken by events. And so we're gonna delay that slightly. It's, um, it's an area, as you will know, that's of extreme interest to a number of stakeholders, mm. um, venting bodies, um, clearly very, very interested in that from a tidal stream point of view. Um, the device developers themselves uh, obviously looking for technologies in that area. We're more than happy um, to help prove and demonstrate, uh, verify any technologies people have for that. Um, it's down to the consenting bodies really to uh, say what they really need to see. Um, and that, that work is going on. Um, so I will mention that later on, Max. Great, thanks. Or would you like to answer Simon's question about growth of MIS in the future? Yeah, I'm just trying to work out what he means. Um, for yeah, sorry to be confusing. I, I, I didn't know if it was in the slides about um, how MIS was going to grow as an organisation, you know, like the direction of travel. Um, was, was that something you wanted to cover? Well, I can, yeah, I can say that. I, I hadn't planned to say anything um, specific on that, but um, I think from what uh, Michelle has um, uh, mentioned already. We, we do have some slides, the next few slides, in fact, are on Catapult Wales. I will you know, preempt those slides a little bit by pointing out that um, we're not just here as MIS. Um, the Wales office is Catapult in Wales, um, and we'll be delivering in Wales all those programmes that we currently deliver in other parts of the UK. Um, but we're using MIS and the funding we've got to build up. So we've got a team of nine at the moment, we expect it to grow. We expect to take over uh, more office space. We're likely to take on a big workshop space um, in Pembroke Dock, so we can start doing a bit more uh, hands-on engineering kind of work. Um, and we'll be looking over the next few years as the MIS project, as an ERDF funded project comes to an end, we'll be looking at what other projects we can carry on um, past that timescale. Um, that will, that will be out of ERDF for Wales and be into the new funding regime, whatever that looks like, shared prosperity fund, um, maybe. Um, we'll be into the prime, I think, then of floating wind um, and starting to see, if we're lucky, and if government is supportive, start to see more commercial tidal projects coming forward. So again, more opportunity to engage. Uh, Wales having really excellent offshore resources um you know it, it's a it's a part of the world that catapult needs to be in so yeah that we expect the office to grow i don't like trying to predict the future though simon so don't no i appreciate that but I, th I think that's a useful scene set for um you know the the, the audience so thanks yeah. for that paul yeah and uh, but uh, like i say you're, you're kind of preempting the the next couple of slides where we talk about some of those projects we already had to yeah great honest, okay. simon I thought our first two years down here would just be Mies, but everything's happened so quickly that there are just other things cropping up all the time. Um, so we're still a little bit ahead of time, but I think uh, unless anybody else has got a, just checking down the list on chat, I don't think we've got anything else that we need to address right now. So um, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll ask Magnus to pick up on is Catapult and Wales slide, and we'll move forward with the presentation there. Excellent, well done. Thanks, Magnus. Yeah, that's fine. Fortunately, uh, Michelle has shared my slides this time. Um, yeah, so as, as Paul says, the next part of this session is to kind of provide an overview of some of the other activities we're up to here in Wales, uh, so projects outside of uh, MIS. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about our work in partnership with Welsh Government uh, to identify how uh, we can best support the ORE sector here and deliver net zero. 
Um, recently, this has involved a few studies in relation, in particular, to the emerging floating wind sector. Um, last year, for example, we completed these two projects, which I've highlighted on this slide, that really aim to, to quantify the sort of like the size of the prize here for uh, floating wind in Wales, both in terms of the benefits it could bring to the supply chain in, in both Wales and the southwest of England, so across the Celtic Sea region. And then there was a second report that looked at more um, in terms of the scale of the resource in, in the Celtic Sea region. And it was in that report that um, you know, we, we highlighted that as much as 50 gigawatts, 50 gigawatts of um, floating wind could be developed in the Celtic Sea in a kind of low case, um, least constrained scenario. So this is a re realizable potential. Um, sort of inevitably, um, you know, that was obviously a, a, a good story and uh, you know, having this great opportunity here, but that inevitably raised further questions and then kind of, well, what do we need to do next to realize this opportunity? And, um, that has uh, led us to these two follow-on projects that we're, we're currently working on, uh, more kind of infrastructure type projects. Uh, one is focused on the grid, <coughs> second project focusing on the ports here. Um, so just to kind of give a brief summary of those, the, the grid study is looking at the transmission network needs um, in Wales in various uh, future offshore renewable energy scenarios, both for North and South Wales. Um, and then it tries to look for uh, solutions to where there are areas of um, bottlenecks or, or grid constraints. Uh, for anyone interested, I'm actually talking a bit more in a bit more length about this uh, tomorrow morning as part of a session in, in the main conference. Um, yeah, and, and the port study that's also going on in parallel to this, um, sort of looking at identifying the, the suitability of Welsh ports in supporting really the uh, things like the construction phase of floating wind projects. Uh, so things like uh, assembling these large substructures that the um, uh, turbines will be hosted on, as well as the actual turbine staging. Um, and then also looking at the next phase um, in terms of can they also support the, the O&M stages of, of floating wind projects here. So it, it's all about um, building an evidence base uh, with, with Welsh, Welsh government, um, looking at identifying low hanging fruit opportunities, um, as well as informing where investment is, is urgently required in order for us to um, really capture this, this golden opportunity. Um, for those interested, do keep an eye on our news feed over the coming weeks. Uh, we're expecting to publish both the grid and port study uh, by the end of um, February, and there will likely be a kind of technical webinar around about the same time as well. Uh, that's all I want to say on, on Welsh Government, so we work hand in hand with them. And I'm now going to pass back to Michelle, who's going to talk about Milford Haven Energy Kingdom. Thanks, Magnus. Yes, the exciting Milford Haven Energy Kingdom project. So it's a £4.5 million project funding through Innovate UK's Prospering the Energy Revolution programme. The project is exploring a decarbonised smart local energy system and what it could look like for Milford Haven, Pembroke and Pembroke Dock. The project is exploring the potential of hydrogen as part of a multi-vector approach to decarbonisation. Central to the project and achieving the net zero is a commitment to engage with the community and local industry, providing insight and opportunities for growth. We have five partners involved in the project. We have Pembrokeshire County Council as lead project, the Port of, the Port of Milford Haven, River Simple, Wales and West Utilities and ourselves. Um, we also have we're also being supported by Arup and Energy Systems Catapult. We also have some supporters and non-funding collaborators, which you can see on the screen, which are Simply Blue Energy, RWE, uh, Welsh Government Energy Service, Western Power Distribution, and Community Energy Pembrokeshire. 
our ambition for the project is to gather insight of the whole energy system around Milford Haven, to identify and design a future smart local energy system based on a truly multi-vector approach and comprehensive energy systems architecture. As a team, we will investigate local renewable energy, including solar, onshore wind, future offshore wind, and biomass for decarbonized gas transition, diversified seed markets for hydrogen across buildings, transport and industry, and also consumer trials for fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen ready hybrid heating systems. We believe this exciting project holds promise in showcasing the far reaching benefits of low carbon energy. If the project's successful, it has the potential to lead the way for and become the first of many smart local energy systems supporting the UK and our local communities in reaching the government's target of a net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050. I'm just going to show you a short video now on the project. I'm here at Milford Waterfront, which is the central location for our Milford Haven Energy Kingdom project. In 2016, whilst government funded Pembroke County Council and the Port of Milford Haven to undertake a study to create a zero carbon area for this marina, we've expanded the focus outwards on a more regional basis, and the Milford Haven Energy Kingdom project now seeks to explore how we can create hydrogen by the rapid growth in renewable electricity and how that can play a vital part in our decarbonised energy future. The project's taken steps to prove that hydrogen has a place here in the UK's largest energy port. That's important because it ensures growth, prosperity, keeping jobs and industry alive here, and making most of the transferable skills from a successful existing energy sector. In order to make sure we have the data that we need for our design, we're really pleased to be hosting a few demonstrators, which includes just behind me on the key, an electrolyzer producing green hydrogen from local electricity for two river simple hydrogen vehicles to use. And we'll also be using a hydrogen boiler to demonstrate hydrogen heating in one of the buildings nearby. The project has the potential to become the first of many smart local energy systems and seeks to make a strong business case for investment in hydrogen to the government and engaged key stakeholders in the waterway. The ISCF funding has been absolutely critical to allow us to take forward a design for a decarbonised whole energy system. Um, ultimately, our project aims to benefit the wider South Wales region and the UK's national net zero aspirations. So as the video just showed, we're proposing to house our hydrogen refueler demonstration on Mackerel Key in Milford Haven. So we will be electrolyzing green hydrogen on site from the port of Milford Haven Smart Energy Local Cluster. If everything goes to plan, this should be in place at the end of May 2021. Um, we will have two River Simple RASA cars, which will predominantly be shared between Pembrokeshire County Council and the port of Milford Haven. COVID allowing, we will have community information events where people could come and sit in the cars and learn all about the hydrogen fuel cell system technology. We'll also be demonstrating a hybrid heat pump and a hydrogen ready boiler at the one port of Milford Haven's buildings. This will allow us to gain vital feedback on the comparison data between existing conventional boilers and also the user experience. These trials are really important as they know they will allow people to test real world hydrogen vehicles and heating equipment. The data from both these trials will feed into the final project reports of the project. These reports include design of underlying systems architecture for a trading platform, infrastructure outline drawings, generation model and hydrogen production modeling, detailed designs for hydrogen with hybrid heating applications, design outline drawings for transport solutions, and also budgets for the complete local energy system. That isn't the full list, there are many reports, but uh, they are the, the main ones there. So if you'd like any more information on this project, we will be launching our web pages um, shortly with on the council's website, um, and it'll have all, we'll be keeping that up to date then so you can see how the project is going. But if you want any information, feel free to contact me or any of the um, partners. They'll always be happy to help. 
So I'm now going to hand you over to Simon Cheeseman, who's going to give you an overview of the Tiger project. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the handover, um, Michelle. Um, Vicky, can you just confirm that people can um, both hear me and see the slides? Yep. All good. OK, thanks very much. So um, I'm Simon Cheeseman from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, I'm the wave and tidal sector specialist for the Catapult. Um, I'm actually based in Cornwall and I run our Cornwall office um, here in the southwest. Um, the reason I'm speaking to you today is that, um, you know, we're, we're almost extricably linked to um, MIS and the activities in Wales. Um, we share, you know, a lot of um, common themes and um, work together on the projects. So there's two areas I'd like to talk to you today. Um, the first one is about the Tiger project, which is a tidal stream um, project. And then um, I'm going to go on to talk about um, the Celtic cluster and uh, our interest in the um, Celtic Sea and floating offshore wind. So what is TIGER? Um, TIGER is the largest uh, European project in terms of value, um, and it's also the largest tidal stream project at the moment. Um, it's funded through the Interreg Channel region, um, and um, I lead that project out of our um, office in, um, in Hale in Cornwall. And it's all about trying to um, provide hard evidence of um, how tidal stream in particular can reduce its costs and present that evidence back to both UK and French governments, because it's a UK French um, uh, collaborative project, but present hard evidence back to um, UK and French governments that tidal stream actually can be part of a future low carbon en energy system. Um, you may recall that uh, in 2018, the Catapult produced the Wave and Tidal Cost Reduction Report, and that provided a forecast of how um, when we get to a, you know, one gigawatt of um, tidal deployments, cost of energy would actually come down to um, probably around sort of £90 per megawatt, which comes in at under um, the cost of UK nuclear um, at the moment. So it's a compelling argument, but um, UK government certainly said, well, we sort of get that, but you know, you're going to have to show us how that's going to happen and, and, and show us what the steps are to actually do that. So we created um, this collaborative project with um, uh, 17 other partners. And um, you'll see here that we've got uh, a number of the, the major developers um, from the tidal stream industry. Um, we've got Cymac Atlantis involved. We've got Sabella in France, HydroQuest in France. Um, we've got um, Orbital uh, Marine Power involved, and then we've got um, people like the European Marine Energy Centre, EMEC, um, as well, and um, also QED Naval, and then um, universities on both the, the, the UK and the French um, side. And the idea is that we're actually going to install um, tidal turbines in these sites. Um, on this map, you could see the blue areas that represent the interreg channel region and these are all um, various regional councils regional development agencies that have funded um, the project in terms of its european funding and then the red squares there show us where the tidal sites are um, the the program completes in 2023 so we had to select sites that were ready to install turbines or almost ready to install turbines so along the south coast unfortunately <laughs> There is only one site that's that's almost ready, and that's the PTEC site off St Catherine's Point in the Isle of Wight. Um, and so I had to stretch the geography, and fortunately we were able to bring in Ramsey Sound, um, which would really be the, the, the feature of, of today's presentation. And I think the relevance for um, uh, Marine Energy Wales and the people in, in Wales. Um, so Ramsey Sound, um, you'd be aware that um, the Delta Stream turbine has been sitting on the seabed there for some time. Um, as part of the Tiger project, um, Canberra and Offshore Southwest, who now um, operate the site on behalf of the Tiger project uh, and on behalf of Canberra and Offshore, um, they will be retrieving the Delta Stream uh, turbine and its foundation and its environmental monitoring um, pod 
and um, effectively carrying out what we like to term a sort of forensic analysis as part of a decommissioning activity um, to see what um, you know what, what what went wrong with the, with the turbine and really learn from that. Um, and so, hoping that that activity um, will start this year, and then we'll look at options to recommission the turbine or put in a new turbine um, as part of the project. Um, but this is really sort of switching the site back on and um, enabling it to take you know, sort of um, advantage of the sort of um, grandfather rights to, to, to rocks that it's got there. So it's an exciting part of the, um, the overall project. Um, and hopefully that, um, you know, our Catapult colleagues in the, in the Pembroke office will be able to support uh, some of that activity in terms of looking at, you know, that um, turbine, understanding what went wrong and working out how to learn from that. I think the other important message I'd like to get you is that um, although the you know the partners are all fully signed up to the project, the project's been running probably for about a year and a half, maybe even two years. Um, and as I say, we go on till um, June 2023. Um, you can still get engaged with the project. There's a um, significant supply chain element to the project, which means we're looking for new technology to support the tidal stream sector. So you know whether you're already involved in the sector or you've got technology. Um, we want to hear from you. Um, we run a series of supply chain seminars already last year in 2020. Um, we'll be running a new series in um, this year and into 2022 as well. And it's an opportunity really for you to showcase your technology, for you to talk to the various title developers and to the sites as well. So maybe your technology is about environmental monitoring, um, data collection, or maybe it's um, different type of materials, different type of bearings. Um, different type of laid material, um, anything that would contribute to cost reduction and um, performance improvement within the tidal sector. Um, we'd, we'd love to hear to, um, from you about that. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to get in touch. Um, there's a picture of my office, not all of it, there's only this one corner, this is my office, not the whole building. But uh, there's the office in, um, in uh, Hale in Cornwall. Um, but please get in touch if you'd like to know more about the tidal um, side of our business and um, getting involved in the Tiger project. So now I'll talk um, a little bit more about the Celtic Sea and floating wind. Um, the sort of topics I want to cover are really the sort of technology types, um, a little bit about the stepping stones project approach and strategy that we've got for the Celtic Sea, um, something about cost reduction and strategy for the, for the Celtic Sea itself, and then really the sort of next steps that we're going to take going forward. So I suppose, first of all, um, you know, there's been a quite a, a healthy debate about um, floating offshore wind within the, the um, Marine Energy Wales Conference so far, which is great. Um, the whole um, view of the Celtic Sea has come on leaps and bounds just in the last year. Um, down in Cornwall, we've been running sort of SME seminars um, on the Celtic Sea and the, the opportunities probably for about sort of the uh, best part of two years now. And I'm pleased to say that uh, just over a year ago, um, we delivered a, a, a joint um, SME event, looking at supply chain in particular um, in Wales as well. And since then, you know, we've been working actively um, with the Welsh government, with Marine Energy Wales, on looking at the opportunities uh, for the supply chain. Um, and the, the thing to point out is that the, there are really two significant bodies now that um, over the past couple of years have become established. So um, in October 29, the Celtic Sea Alliance um, was formed, and that's a memorandum of understanding between um, the uh, Marine Energy Wales, um, Marine Renewables Industry of Ireland, and Cornwall and Isle of Sicily Local Enterprise Partnership to really collaborate around opportunities for um, floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. Um, and look at it from a strategy point of view um, and be a sort of um, a sort of political with the small p sort of lobbying body um, to um, you know try and persuade government to um, introduce a, a favorable CFD for um, floating offshore wind, try and impress upon um, the Crown Estate that um, you know it should seriously look at leasing rounds for the Celtic Sea and pretty quickly, and really to try and sort of focus attention on those opportunities. And that's all been very successful. So the Celtic Sea Alliance is, is now sort of um, 
Its members include RWE, Simply Blue Energy, um, Industry of Wales, DP Energy, um, Marine Energy Wales, I say, are, are all part of that, that set up anyway. So that's the sort of political um, overall strategy piece. Um, and then there's the cluster, the Celtic cluster. And that is really set up to act as the um, mouthpiece for the supply chain, um, particularly in Wales and the Southwest. And it's there to um, really you know, be able to promote um, the capabilities and the capacity of the regional supply chains to developers and really to um, enable the supply chain to engage with the developers and say, look, you know, this is how we can do this um, down here. This is how we can um, help you in, uh, design, fabricate, manufacture this technology and actually install it. Because you'll appreciate that, um, you know, in Wales, you've got um, huge um, capabilities um, and, um, you know, in terms of manufacturing, um, steel work, offshore operations and things. Um, down in Cornwall, you know, offshore operations, they've been doing that for a long, long time all around the world. Uh, and bringing these two supply chains together is incredibly important and making sure that they, they act with a single voice. Um, and, and I suppose until recently, you know, the Celtic Sea and the, the capabilities of perhaps Wales and um, the Southwest weren't really on the map. And it's only uh, recently that the Offshore Wind Industry Council now um, recognised the Celtic cluster and the Celtic cluster will go through a sort of um, a, a launch process um, later on this year. And so in terms of looking at the technologies here and, you know, what's likely in the Celtic Sea, um, you know, in terms of build out then, um, it's likely to be we'll see barge, semi-sub and um, multi-spa type technologies. Um, the real deep, you know, 75 metre spa technologies uh, are not really suitable for being built around the ports around Wales um, or the southwest. So, you know, our, our, the preference will be for the other types of um, technology. And you may be familiar now if you've been tracking the floating offshore wind story, you may be familiar with this side slide that really starts to show you what we've termed as a stepping stones um, project approach to developing um, floating wind in the Celtic Sea. Um, this enables the really the supply chain, the local supply chain to cut its teeth on um, you know, supporting uh, development of this technology and um, getting involved in the installation operations offshore. And we sort of envisage that, that probably the first ready site would be the Wave Hub site. That's been repurposed um, from Wave Energy to floating offshore wind. Um, as a site, it's now up for sale. And um, Steve Jeremy mentioned in the um, earlier session conference of that sale process would probably go through by about Easter. Um, so that's 32 megawatts of uh, site capability. Um, it's got a grid connection already there. Um, a purchaser of that site could bid into the um, auction round at the end of this year and I could see the first floating offshore wind site um, in the Celtic Sea. And on that little map on the right hand side of the slide, it's the black dot uh, on that map. Um, Pembrokeshire demonstration zone, you're probably familiar with that. Uh, again, Steve Jeremy briefed on that earlier in the day and sort of said that, you know, that they're looking at that perhaps becoming some sort of um, super hub in terms of electrical connection for um, activity uh, in the Celtic Sea, because the build out potential is so large that what we want to do is strategically manage um, interconnectivity of um, arrays in the Celtic Sea and decide how best to bring, you know, whether it's electrons or hydrogen shore, um, how that should be done. You know, we've, we've, we've learned from offshore wind, fixed bottom offshore wind in the North Sea, and, um, you know, seen the signs of, you know, the, the curtailment that's going on of that because of the, the, um, the, the frustrations over planning processes to bring multiple cables ashore. So we certainly want to take a more strategic approach to some of those infrastructure issues um, for the Celtic Sea. Um, then you would have heard um, talk about um, uh, Simply Blue Energy, who have got a joint venture with Tatel, um, Blue Gem Wind, and their Erebus site, that's uh, 96 megawatt site. And then um, also their Valora site. And now um, I think it was yesterday that, um, <coughs> excuse me, they announced a, um, a joint venture with Shell um, for an Emerald uh, site um, of um, initially 300 megawatts, potentially growing to um, <coughs> one gigawatt um, off, off the Irish coast in the, uh, in the Celtic Sea. So you can see that actually this, this stepping stones approach is actually coming to um, 
fruition now. And so we've got, you know, the likes of um, Blue Jim Wind actually doing, you know, their pre-consenting activity. And we'll see the same for um, the other sites. And so this offers an opportunity for um, the supply chain to ready itself, um, take advantage of the uh, catapult initiatives that enable companies and help companies to get ready for bidding into um, offshore wind um, procurement um, cycles and also get them um, what we call fit for um, offshore renewables if they're not already um, in that space. So lots we can do there. In terms of the numbers, um, we've got lots of reports out now that try and quantify um, these sort of things. This is an extract um, from the supply chain report, the Southwest Wales supply chain report that was done in early 2020. And it just starts to show you how much stuff is needed to um, start to install um, these, um, these floating offshore wind platforms and floating offshore wind arrays. Um, and the, you know, it, our, our view in the catapult is it, it is going to happen. Um, you know, we, we've seen um, uh, Bayes talk about um, uh, consultations on CFD for floating wind. Um, we're pretty confident now that fixed bottom offshore wind will go into a pot three, um, floating will go into a into a pot two. Um, we're, we're now seeing you know consultations from um, the Crown State in terms of technology innovation for floating offshore wind. Um, and then um, yesterday, um, Catapult published its um, report on um, the route to um, zero subsidy for floating offshore wind. And there we took um, a fairly bold approach in terms of saying, you know, what that rollout could look like, and both in terms of Celtic Sea and um, sort of northeast sites, um, you know, there were where there were three really um, sort of scenarios that they looked at, and they were 75 gigawatts in total by 2050, 100 gigawatts by 2050, or 150 gigawatts um, by 2050. So you know, these these are huge numbers, and I think the aspiration. I mean, you know, the government's being cautious and saying, well, we'll probably look at one gigawatt by um, 2030. But I think there's an argument and, and uh, it was talked about in the um, in the last session of the, of the um, conference today that maybe to, to draw investment in, you've got to be more ambitious and talk in terms of maybe three gigawatts um, by 2030. And although you may not install all of that, you want to be well on the way to installing that to achieve um, some of these targets. Which remember are, are, are driven by our um, our net zero um, targets for 2050, um, and an increasing demand on um, on energy. So, um, floating offshore wind has got to go through a cost reduction um, piece, and some of that initially will be led by just putting stuff out there and learning, um, but very quickly it spins around and it's um, it's all about innovation and, and driving down costs. And so typically, you know, no surprises about where we have to apply ourselves um, in terms of that innovation. Um, and this slide sort of um, starts to suggest, you know, how that chips away at um, cost reduction. And so the strategy really, you know, for the Celtic Sea and, and the sort of the ducks we've got to get in a line. Um, we've got the Celtic Sea Alliance now, that, that's that sort of, um, lobbying body that's done a, a great job in sort of raising the profile of floating wind generally in the Celtic Sea in particular. Um, you know, we've got clear evidence that there's a there's going to be a change in the, um, the CFD allocation, um, probably around sort of from around five. Um, and importantly, you know, we've seen evidence that the government is quite sincere about, through the industrial strategy, its plans for um, increasing UK content from where it is at the moment for, for offshore wind at around 40% up to 60%, um, and, and that's a real challenge actually. Um, but you know, we've seen hard evidence that, that the government's prepared to hold developers feet to the fire now to make sure they actually come up with procurement plans that genuinely will deliver at least 60% UK content. <clears throat> and I think if you heard you know, some of the earlier presentations today, you'd have heard developers you know, genuinely trying to, to look at ways to make that happen. But I think you're, you're acknowledged that you know, that comes at a price. You know, if, if you're interested in cheap electricity, you'll go to a supply chain that can provide it at the lowest cost. Um, if you're interested in the UK content, there may there may be a you know a premium 
on that and you may not get your cheapest electricity straight away. Um, so that's work that we're doing at the moment to um, help inform the government in terms of what that, that premium might be and what that looks like. Um, also, we've seen um, calls to look at ports and uh, calls for innovation evidence. So, you know, a real um, wealth of activity coming out of uh, both Westminster and also um, Welsh government now. You know, the Welsh government looking at sort of port studies, um, grid studies that were mentioned earlier. Um, really trying to understand you know, the status quo at the moment, but also what, what's needed in the future. So um, there's a real collaborative effort now that the catapult is involved in um, working with uh, Welsh Government, with Marine Energy Wales and um, with um, organisations in the southwest to just try and understand and structure that um, for the benefit of the region. And part of the cluster role really will be to um, develop an overarching sort of strategy that suits um, an umbrella strategy that suits both Wales and the South West. And then we'd expect, you know, Welsh government to develop their own um, core strategy and um, Cornwall and the South West to, to develop its own strategy as well. And there is now talk about, um, you know, the Celtic Sea perhaps as a, an economic development zone and recognising um, the emergence of um, aspirations from Ireland in terms of um, both fixed bottom wind um, and in the longer term floating wind. And so, you know, it'd be sensible for us to work together on that to achieve some sort of economies of scale um, in, the, in the supply chain, um, recognising a, a broader pipeline than we could do individually, um, but still recognising that, that each, you know, whether, whether you know, country, devolved government or, or region, um, still has its own um, hurdles to, to jump through, still has its own, its own sort of um, political issues to, to sort of cover off, but generally, there's a sense that we should work together on this. And I think that's a, that's a really good thing. So, you know, in terms of projects, you know, we can see a clear um, project pipeline now, that's great. Um, we've had the Crown Estates do its uh, floating wind market survey as a, as a sort of precursor to looking at future leasing rounds, that's fantastic. And um, the Celtic cluster at the moment, we're, we're looking very carefully at um, directing that, that regional supply chain um, participation by understanding both the capability and the capacity of our, of our regional supply chains. On the research and development front, then um, the Offshore Wind Industry Council now has um, published a roadmap. Um, no surprises really what's in there. Um, the Catapult's got the Floating Offshore Wind Centre of Excellence um, that is looking at um, UK floating offshore wind in the round. Um, and then down in Cornwall, we've got a Marine Eye project, Marine Innovation, that's doing some preemptive work with SMEs in Cornwall, looking at sort of technology and processes that can be deployed. Um, and then we've got a number of um, other um, potential projects um, which would um, provide funding, resource, and really the horsepower to start driving forward a lot of the initiatives that we want to get going on this. So, you know, it, it really is a um, sort of perfect storm really of, of, of timing, of activity, of opportunity um, to develop out um, the Celtic Sea. And I suppose in terms of um, next steps and um, for Paul, this is my uh, last slide. Um, you know, th this is the work in progress really. Um, you know, the CFD process I think is, is well underway and I think we expect that to sort of come good. Um, an overarching Wales and Southwest strategy to secure opportunity in the future. Um, that's work in progress at the moment, and we should be uh, going public with that um, in the not too far distant future. Um, and then the plan for the cluster in terms of prioritizing what needs to be done and when, then we're already well underway doing that. And we've got a number of sort of um, different work streams, um, some of which uh, MISA are involved in, so that's the Britain Board study and some other work that they're doing, some of that they've been doing um, elsewhere in the catapult. Um, and some work that we're doing down in the um, down in Cornwall as well. But we do need granularity on, on issues and understand where these constraints are and how we have to overcome them. Um, and obviously, you know, one is, has been mentioned before around grid. Um, you know, we, we've got some real grid issues. I know there are, there are um, studies being done um, through National Grid and the Oftos. Um, and then there's the issue of ports, um, understanding our port infrastructure, how the ports can collaborate and work together because this is too big an elephant for one port to, to deal with. Um, and then the issues around the broader supply chain in terms of um, both capacity and capability. 
And finally, sort of, um, you know, for the supply chain, understanding those scale of operations, because, you know, providing a, a, a couple of floating platforms at WaveHub to provide 30 megawatts of um, capacity is one thing. Um, to go up to 96 megawatts for Erebus, you probably need a slight change of, of supply chain capacity. You definitely need a change to go to 300 megawatts. And then life is completely different at 500 up to one gigawatt to three gigawatt. So we're trying to take both a, a short term view to understand what we can do now, but also look at take a long term view and understand how that supply chain can morph into um, a really vibrant and, and um, flexible um, beast that can deliver that those huge amounts of capacity that we generally think are going to be needed um, in the future. And a lot of that at the moment is down to modeling work. Our, um, our report out yesterday, the, um, the route to subsidy free, um, we've done a lot of modeling um, using um, you know, some of the models we've had from fixed bottom offshore wind, um, but we need to go in a lot more detail and look at some of um, you know, how construction processes, uh, next generation um, platform technology, platform design, how can they be built in relatively shallow ports and fitted out and then and towed offshore? Um, what's our strategy for um, offshore maintenance? Um, it's probably a tow to shore um, strategy. Um, what does that look like and what does that mean your infrastructure needs to look like at your ports? Um, key to all driving that is the O&M strategy for the turbines. I think the platforms are man enough, they can stay out there for, for you know, 20, 25 years. We've seen that in oil and gas. It's the turbines themselves that, that, are, that are slightly more fragile. And even for fixed bottom need um, continual maintenance and suffer from um, unplanned maintenance. So, you know, being far offshore in a, in a particularly windy and, um, um, and on a platform that's sort of still you know, got some motion sway to it um, causes some you know, real head scratching for uh, our operations and maintenance people. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I'm going to hand back to Paul. Um, yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, just stay where you are for a sec. Um, we're ahead of time, so I'm not going to move on to innovation challenges straight, straight away because we do okay. have from uh, Andronicus, um, uh, which relates to you. So if we deal with that, um, what he's asking is um, three things really. How does one join the Celtic Sea Alliance? When are we planning to launch something like a uh, Celtic Sea supply chain cluster? And what are the links with Deep Wind? Yeah, so I, th I think um, joining the Celtic Sea Alliance, I think that's by invitation. I, th I think you've got to prove your credentials in terms of your, um, your capabilities as a developer and your intentions and your um, investment potential, um, because it's a, a very serious, very focused um, alliance. Um, and then the, the supply chain cluster, the Celtic Sea supply chain cluster, um, as I say, that's, that's probably going to be launched um, uh, in quarter two. Uh, of this year. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of links to deep wind cluster, yeah, so you know, the clusters do talk to each other. Um, through the Offshore Wind Industry Council, there is a clusters forum. Um, they do get together and also through the Floating Offshore Wind Centre of Excellence that does engage with the clusters as well. So those conversations are starting to happen. Um, I think there's still a bit of a a debate in some areas about what are clusters and what are they supposed to do and how they set up. But the Caltex cluster has got a board, it's got an interim board at the moment that's um, chaired by the, the, uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and is working with both um, um, uh, Welsh Government and Marine Energy Wales and Cornwall and Isles, a silly local enterprise partnership, really to, to, to map out that direction of travel and make sure we can get a strategy in place that suits both um, of those regional um, partners. Any other questions? No, I think that's brilliant, uh, Simon. Thanks very much. I thought it was brilliant too. Well, yeah, no, <laughs> you're on the ball. Um, one thing I would just say, I guess, is that the Celtic Sea Alliance is more a political thing than a kind of operational thing. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I'll just move on. I'm not gonna say very much about innovation challenges. Um, let me just share my screen now. Uh, 
unless Vicky can share my screen for me. I can't seem to make the damn thing work. Give me two seconds and I'll pull up. Brilliant, thanks. Um, and, and while I'm on, um, apologies for some of the slight sound issues we've had. Of course, we're all at the mercy of our um, internet connections these days, uh, but we're doing the best we can. Am I up yet? Um, uh, you're good to go. Okay, so you can see my innovation challenges page. I hope. Yep. Uh, Thanks for that, Vicky. Sorry, I'm uh, so inept with these things. Um, so one of the ways that Catapult in general supports and stimulates innovation is through innovation challenges. Um, and we'll try and use the same approach through Mies. Um, there are some standard aspects of an innovation challenge uh, that make it a good one. Um, we need a clear statement of the problem. So this is, as much as possible, this is technology pull, um, or rather market pull, I should say, rather than technology push. Um, we need an owner. We need somebody who says, this is my problem. If you can solve it for me, I'll be your customer. Um, and an idea of how much it's worth, because this is not, this is not blue sky research. This is not um, academic work. This is us as a catapult trying to find the resources to solve a problem that somebody's got in a marketplace and it will have a value um, associated with it. And some will be better defined than others, um, but they'll all have that as a, a kind of characteristic. Um, from catapult's point of view, we don't really mind at what stage of development the solution for a problem is. I mean, ideally, of course, if there's, if uh, some offshore renewable company has a, has a problem they can state and we can solve it next week, that's brilliant. But some of these problems are difficult problems to solve. And uh, it may be that somebody's got a potential solution to that problem, but it's really early stage. Uh, you know, it could be as much as back of the envelope. Um, Within Mies and within Catapult in general, we can take an idea at any stage, do a little bit of work on it and move that to the next stage. Now, within Mies, we won't necessarily fund the entire development of a solution, but we might be able to do the very early stages, um, prove a concept to the stage where we can go and look for other funding and other partners to help it take the next, uh, the next step. Um, one of the innovations we like, I mean, remember, innovation doesn't have to involve invention. Uh, innovation can be taking something that's perfectly well established in a different sector and moving into a new sector. So that's the kind of thing that we can look at as well. Um, and very definitely, we don't have to have a complete solution. So if you've got what you think is part of a puzzle, part of a solution for a problem, we can help you find the rest of that, um, whether that's finding a way to power your solution at sea using batteries or uh, solar panels or whatever. Um, and the, the, the final bullet point there is uh, MIS, uh, it's limited in its funding. We can't spend millions of pounds on anything, but we can help you raise millions of pounds uh, to really fund your, your idea and get it through the stages through, through to market. Um, and within Catapult, we use the Knowledge Transfer Network um, and their Innovation Exchange. Now, the Knowledge Transfer Network is a kind of sister organisation to the Catapults. It's not quite a Catapult in its own right, um, but it supports all the Catapults. It's funded through Innovate UK in the same kind of way that we're funded. Um, and frankly, it doesn't matter what sector you're involved in, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a company or an individual, if you're in the innovation space, it's well worth 
seeking out the KTN's Innovation Exchange because there are lots of opportunities for you to apply your skills and expertise to solve other people's problems. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sector agnostic as well, which I think is important. I'm hoping that this will... No, that's not going to do it. Okay, when I was playing with it earlier, it enabled me to actually show you some of the um, some of the challenges that they've got live at the moment, but apparently not at the moment. Sorry about that. Uh, as Max mentioned earlier, uh, when he raised that question, we do have an innovation challenge in mind at the moment. This has come about because uh, in Wales, we have Natural Resources Wales, um, we have RSPB, um, who are both concerned about the impact that tidal stream devices might have on particularly diving birds. Now, NRW is keen to understand impacts on any underwater birds, mammals, whatever, even fish. Um, and so what we're looking at at the moment is how do we know what diving birds are doing when they're under the water whether there's a tidal turbine there or not, because what we need to know is how has their behavior changed? What are they doing at the moment? If we put a tidal turbine in, what is it likely to do? And then if we do actually put a tidal turbine in, what is it actually doing? We need this information. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to prove that in fact, it doesn't matter if you put a tidal turbine in there because diving birds don't mind. They can get around, they can, they can avoid them. They can maybe even swim through them. Um, and there's no real impact, but we don't know at the moment. We simply don't know. There's no evidence that they do cause problems, but not much evidence that they don't. So for us, the customer um, would be consenting bodies or other stakeholders, RSPB, local community who want, who want to be comfortable that having a tidal stream turbine farm off their shore isn't going to be impacting the natural world, isn't going to be impacting the environment. Um, but also the turbine designers themselves, they need to know if there is a problem, what they can do to try to design that problem out. And um, I, we would never try to suggest solutions, but that's uh, our role is to explain what the problem is, um, what the challenge is, and then gather in those suggestions. But just to give you an example here, if we could put a a lightweight pinger onto a diving bird. If we could capture a diving bird and tag it with something that gave off a sound or a signal underwater and we could track that signal, that would be hugely valuable. We could, we could do it, we could do a baseline study where there are no turbines, but in an environment where we think we'd like to put one and gather information about what birds do at the moment. That would be interesting just from an academic point of view. Um, but then we could look at what happens when we do put tidal turbines in and see if anything changes. And if things change, whether that's bad enough to worry about. Um, and then if we put mitigations on the turbine, we can see if that again brings back that behavior that was there in the first place. So what might the issues be? Is something uh, like a lightweight ping up? Well, it'd need to be small enough, uh, not, to dis not in itself to change behavior. Um, if it's powered, we need to know about battery life and the durability of those batteries and the whole system underwater. Um, if it needed an array of microphones, um, who's going to put that in place? And how do you get the data from the microphones? And is that array of microphones in itself going to be a bigger damage to the environment than, than the turbines that we put in? Um, and if, if, if this is a sonic system, does that increase noise pollution to a level that people are going to worry about? So those might be a set of um, issues. What would MIS do to help? Well, we could we could do things like desk studies. Um, the reason we're one of the reasons we haven't gone ahead with this innovation challenge yet is there is actually a desk study being done now by Swansea University um, to look at what's been done in the past, to look at what um, the issues might be. We'll wait and see what the outcomes and recommendations from that study are um, before we go ahead with our innovation challenge. But beyond that, we could help 
design a prototype. We could certainly help manufacture some prototypes and then test those prototypes. And if uh, an array of microphones is going to be a big capital cost that maybe somebody who designs little sonic tags couldn't possibly afford, well, that's where we can pick things up. That's where we could put in place using our money, using our funding and uh, our ability to operate these things. We could maybe put in place an array of microphones somewhere so that we could test a whole load of uh, different types of underwater tags. Um, and more importantly, we can find and we can uh, pull together a consortium of partners that have all the skill sets capable to take this through to completion. So that's a, a kind of general approach that we might take. Um, at the moment on that, we're still, um, we're still working with various stakeholders. So we still need to go back to uh, NRW and RSPB and make sure that they still feel that this is a, a relevant innovation challenge. Um, we're actually also working with KTN to understand exactly how we can put the, the innovation challenge out there. Um, we now have a website and so we can, um, we can promote that innovation challenge as it goes on through our, our website. As I say, we're waiting for the Swansea report. We'll always use MEW as well as KTN and our website to promote innovation challenges as we put them together, as, um, as new challenges uh, come through. Um, and that's a really key important point. If you, as a stakeholder out there, if you have a challenge that you think we could help support finding a solution for, please come forward, please give us, um, give us a heads up. Tell us what you think your particular challenge is. And if, if it seems appropriate for me support with the resources we've got, we'll certainly put it out as an innovation challenge. If we don't think we can cope with it, then we've got lots of other partners who can, and we can, we can suggest different ways that you can get a solution to your, your challenge. Um, and although MIS, uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, MIS is res restricted to supporting companies in Wales, we do have a little bit of flexibility. We can support companies outside Wales if we can show the benefit would be in Wales. And there are so many uh, opportunities for solutions to be implemented in Wales that I think we've got a good excuse for supporting non-Welsh companies in this space. Plus, we can broaden it out through other catapult resources to support companies that are outside Wales. Um, and that's a very brief introduction to innovation challenges. It'll be much better when we've got a live innovation challenge and we can start reporting on how we have supported that, use it as a case study. So, so watch this space. Innovation challenges are something we want to promote. Um, and I think that's our presentations done. Um, we are a little bit ahead of time, which is always good. Um, we'll stay online. We're happy to have uh, a kind of um, uh, free chat. Um, if you put your questions in chat or if you, um, if you want to uh, open up your video um, one at a time, so we don't get overwhelmed. Uh, we'll stay online for another 15, 20 minutes, um, and then I'll wrap up at about five to five. Um, if you don't, if we don't get to answer your questions now, we'll, you know, we've got a, we've got them in chat, so we'll we will respond to you offline. Um, but coming up, we this year will have our Mies annual conference at some point later this year, and we hope might be a bit ambitious, but we hope that will be a physical conference, um, but only, of course, if COVID allows. Um, we also will be planning a series of technical webinars. Magnus mentioned that we might do something around the two Welsh studies, Welsh government studies that we're doing. Um, that could be uh, late next month or maybe early April. Um, no real restrictions on when we do those, if we do them virtual but we would like to do some of them as physical technical uh, workshops. If we do physical workshops, they'll probably be in and around the universities that are part of our partnership. Um, but again, it, that all depends on COVID letting us. Um, so that's, that's all I'm gonna say. So if I can exit my presentation and get back to our... Uh, my Zoom view. I'll do that. Vicky, I'm going to have to ask you to uh, 
to take my presentation offline, if you can. That's you. Oh, excellent. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Sorry, I, I just don't seem to be able to work Zoom. I'm much better with Teams, um, but I don't seem to be able to work Zoom. So do we have any questions? Hi, Paul. Hi, Max, again. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes. Yeah, Sorry, just... that wasn't meant to sound like a criticism or anything. <laughs> um, I was just um, uh, uh, reflecting on your, I put it in the chat actually, that um, that um, the problem definition on those, uh, on sort of um, blade impacts and that sort of thing isn't necessarily just diving birds, but no. it can, any sort of animal in the water, whether it's, um, marine mammals, which has been looked at quite a lot in the UK, um, and also fish, um, which is a particular thing in, in jurisdictions like um, Canada, um, where you're not allowed to harm fish, <laughs> unless you're a fisherman, in which case you can do whatever you like. But, um, 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 and you know, in all of these circumstances, there's been a huge amount of work done on on, uh, on these sort of aspects. and, and uh, um, and a lot of it has shown no no real um, evidence of, of impact or harm, but of course, it remains a kind of thing that we're still trying to sort of close off as a as an issue, and um, so that um, you know would certainly be interesting and useful in terms of that innovation challenge. So very interested to see that. So more of a comment, I suppose, than, than anything. But yeah. yeah, thanks, Max. Um, what what I would say in response is, you know, we have to narrow these things down. Um, it's unlikely we'd, we'd have the same technologies looking at diving birds as we would at um, dolphins or seals uh, or fish. So in this case, we make it very specific to diving birds. People, I mean, just, just to talk through the process that, that we're thinking of, people understand how you tag birds. Um, and there's, you know, there, there are rules, there's uh, what's acceptable, when it's acceptable to do it in a particular uh, species um, life cycle or season um, and then so that gives you the opportunity of saying well we can do this now how do we extend that so it works underwater um, for fish I frankly I know nothing about how you tag fish um, maybe there, there are synergies between fish and diving birds but one thing we do know about um, the likes of dolphins is you really you can't go near them you know you can't physically tag them without a significant risk of damaging them through that process. Seals, I'm told, are very robust. Seals, I'm told, you can whip them out of the water, stick them on a boat, glue something to them, chuck them back in the water, and they think it's a big game. Um, so we're, it's, it's going to be horses for courses. Well, yeah, no, it's interesting. And right, no, so fish, yeah, plenty of fish tags out there and, and, and methods of doing that, even to the extent of tagging Atlantic shark, you know, the jaws. <laughs> so... Don't know how you go about doing that, but anyway, they are tagged, um, which maybe isn't a concern in the UK, but um, it is elsewhere. So um, yeah, they, they, I suppose it's just um, when looking at this, it's worth just looking mm. at that wider synergy because it may well be that it's got double the bang for buck, as it were. Absolutely, absolutely. Very uh, hi, Max. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, can I can I just jump in before I jump in the call? <laughs> um, in, in the um, Environmental Audit Committee. Um, was asking for evidence, wasn't it, on um, uh, environment, environmental impacts of tidal schemes and how these could be minimised. And in doing some research for that, there was the um, uh, the Ocean Energy Systems Environmental Initiative and yes. Science Report. Yes, which and is very sort of the conclusions in there said that there was real no evidence of impact, and and exactly. I, that's down to our ability to to monitor and collect evidence. Or, or rather the fact that the monitoring processes so far have, have actually come up with nothing of, of such. It's a bit of both. Nothing's been come up with. A um, lot of good work's been done, but it, it still says it's a remaining um, uncertainty that has to be retired in that report. And yeah. I think that's fair. Um, so it's just really having the definitive test. I mean, ideally, it would be that you actually kind of release a bunch of tags uh, whether they're artificial or not, um, and and sort of just see where they go, you know, because there's a kind of pressure flow effect in front of turbines as well as, you know, if you obviously it's a marine animal of some sort, whether it's a bird or whatever, 
the potential that it would take avoidance action in any case because you know yeah. generally birds don't collide with rocks or other objects in the yeah. water yeah great okay thanks everyone i've left to drop off now paul thank you very much yeah well thanks simon yeah max one i guess one further point that, that we think is a really big point is that there is no negative evidence out there at the moment but then again there aren't any big arrays of turbines either sure. um and um, there's a question as to whether any solution or any data we gather on one or two devices around one or two devices actually has any relevance at all if you move to arrays of tens or you know maybe in some cases hundreds of um, devices so you know we're at the very early stage um, it, that's why we're interested in the technologies um, other people will then have to say whether or not that's gathering the right data. Sure. Okay, um, I see, um, i just pick up on Dave Clark's note. Um, that's the Swansea uh, work that I referred to. I forgot, of course, they're doing two. Um, so, um, uh, and scheduled to be complete in the spring. So other people have mentioned other studies. Um, I think Dave and his team at Swansea will be picking up on a lot of those other studies. And that's one of the reasons why we're waiting. They're, they're doing a lot of the legwork. It doesn't make sense to launch an innovation challenge until we're right up to date with all the work that everybody else has done. Feel free to, to chip in if you want, Dave. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um... Just, uh, uh, just, just to bring everyone sort of up to speed, basically, uh, uh, we're undertaking two, uh, two death studies, one on behalf of Welsh Government and um, uh, one on behalf of Natural Resources Wales, both of which are scheduled for the spring. Um, for Welsh Government, we've been asked to look at the uh, potential methods for monitoring the effects of, uh, of, of marine turbines on uh, marine mammals on sea, uh, seabirds and fish um, uh, and in particular to look at turbine strike methodologies, method, methods for looking at that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then secondly for NRW uh, we've been asked to look particularly at migratory fi uh, fish uh, impacts across the MRE sector as a whole uh, and to design for MRW some uh, acoustic tracking arrays. So, so those are the two pieces of work we're doing. Um, we're, we're trying to talk to as many people in the sector as possible alongside, de uh, uh, alongside um, death study work. And, and, and we're also talking to uh, equipment suppliers uh, 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 and so on to sort of understand the technologies that, that are actually out there and what they can do. Um, I've seen quite a few of the names on, on, on you know, on the, uh, the board today are people we've already talked to, but um, basically if anybody feels they have something to offer in that territory, please get in touch. We'd, we'd, we'd welcome, uh, we'd welcome that. We've got about another four weeks of, if you like, sort of work to do to actually close down the data collection and, and uh, drafting stage to the point of a of, of, of final draft. So it's, it's getting a little bit tight for time now, but you know, we've gathered a lot. Um, and Paul, uh, and, and just to sort of pick up on Paul's point about seabirds, I think there are existing technologies out there that could do the job, but it won't be cheap. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Well, I mean, that's then, that's the, the basis of an innovation challenge. If you've got a, a thing that works, but it's too expensive, it's a cost reduction project um, yeah. and that gives a very nice focus for um, technology developers out there, maybe in different sectors, to apply their cost reduction technologies to, to this. Um, but the other thing I'll say is I think it's quite interesting that in the UK, the big problem uh, in terms of um, environmental concern is around the charismatic species, the whales, the dolphins, the porpoises, whereas in Canada and, and America, American waters, it's very much fish. Um, and it's seen as a, a real commercial issue, the fact that you might be damaging fish stocks. So, you know, it depends where you are in the world, what is the most important uh, aspect of the environmental concerns. Okay, do we have anybody else? 
So Ian's just made a good point. Um, if anybody else has got a suggestion for innovation challenge, um, we'd love to hear it. Um, we're getting close to the point where I was planning to wrap up. So I think um, I'm just going back through the list 